Joshua Services Committee meeting of Tuesday, 30th of June. Lucy, can we have sediment and apologies, please? Good morning, everyone. We have 16 members present today. We are quorates, and I have apologies from Councillor Yen and Councillor Karen Crothers. Councillor Nicol, Councillor Dick, and Councillor... Does Councillor Nicol and Councillor Dick are not present, but maybe along in a moment. We have 17 members present now. Thanks, Lucy. Members, any declarations of interest? Stephen? Yeah, uh, just to be safe, I think I've got uh, an interest um, in item, which one would it be? Item 15, because uh, I've got an involvement with one of the organisations, but as it's a report just for noting, um, I don't feel that we'd have to leave the room in order to consider it. Thanks for that, Stephen. Any other member? Okay. At this juncture, can I ask folks if they've got the amended paper for the external scrutiny of social work services, item 6, and the two replacement pages, page 52 and page 84 for item 5. Does everybody have them, or do they need copies? Okay, in that case, that's... Oh, Jane? There should be two for the item 5 and the electronic amended paper for item six. Stephen? I think I may need a, a paper copy of item six if it's an amended one. Thank you. We'll arrange for that to be done. In fact, I think I have a spare copy here you can have. Chair, I'm, I'm the same, I think. I, I, I don't an amended copy. I've only got the main okay. council papers. Can we get, can we arrange for a, 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 an electronic Printed or a hard copy of item six the amended paper for Councillor Ferguson, please. And one for Councillor Sign. Marion, Councillor McCutcheon, that's three so far. Does anybody else other than Councillor Carruthers, Ian, that's four? Four copies of item six, the, the, the electronic amended version. Do you know how it, Jane? That's Four copies now, then, I think. Five. Five copies, please, and we'll just carry on with the business and we'll have a two-minute opportunity to read the amended paper when we get to item six. Okay? So... Carrying on the business in hand today, minute of the meeting of 28th of April 2015 for approval. Graham. Can I come in, Chair? Yep, it just says on page one that I'm a uh, represent Annandale South, but in fact I represent Annandale North. Thanks for that. Can we have that amended, please? Any other points on the, the minute? Stephen? Thank you, Chair. It's actually to do with the... the agenda itself um it's just a couple of technical things if at your discretion but if, if i could maybe raise them just now because i don't know what the best point during the meeting would be to raise them um, okay in that case just let us know what they are okay um now this is a bit of a daft laddie thing but uh item seven do we have a director of social work sitting beside me chief social work officer the, the, the director service director Okay, that's fine. I did, wasn't sure if it was a, a legacy term for the director because I know we've changed the structure of social work. So, and the other thing was uh, in item twelve, where that's the local government act. Two of the papers relate to paragraph five of part one of schedule seven a, and one relates to paragraph eight. So I'm just wondering, should we just tighten that up because effectively one of the papers isn't covered by that uh, resolution? I'll have Lucy deal with that during the course of the meeting as well before we get to that, but thanks for that bit, Stephen. Lucy, do you want to deal with that at the time? Okay, in that case, the minute itself of the meeting of 28th April, is that a true record other than that the points have been raised? Okay, thanks for that. If we go to item number four, Social Work Services Revenue Budget 2014-15, the outturn report by Chief Social Work Officer, Head of Children, Families and Criminal Justice Service. And I'm sure you'd be delighted at the, the content item for Lillian. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, just to say to members that clearly uh, we inherited a, a significant overspend at the beginning of um, the reign of the new management team, so we've worked incredibly hard over that period of time to bring the budget in line and uh, clearly I'm, uh, I'm, I would hope that members would share my um, pleasure with the team that we've got to the point of a 19k underspend um, and Angela and Colin will take any questions if required. Thank you. Thanks, members. We can have stunned silence when we get an underspend. Iva? Chair, it's just a wee bit of information. How can you have an overachievement on planned income? Surely that would be unplanned income because you didn't know it was coming. And if we didn't actually have the 723,000 in there, how much of that was planned and how is it full 723 that came in this year that might not be there for future years? Colin? Apologies. Um, 723,000, some of it was relating to uh, historical charging orders that have come through this financial year. So it wasn't planned, depending on the circumstances of the clients and uh, uh, what happened during the year. When we set the budget every year, we look at realigning the budget based on our assumptions for the future year, taking into account any one-offs and removing them to set a balanced budget going forward. And we'll leave the pedantic bit out. Uh, any other members? Andy? Uh, through you, Chair. Can we just, uh, just clarify what the found the light turn budget position was at the end of the last financial year? We might not have that information before us, but uh, as far as I remember, we had a balanced budget last year. But Colin, can you recall? Uh, yes, from memory, uh, was a, there was an overspend, but a, it was a small overspend, maybe um, 47,000 from memory. But I can double check on that and let you know. I presume, Andy, if Colin sends you that information after the meeting, you'd be happy with that? Um, well, actually, no. I think it needs to be recognised it was a very small overspend at the final turn figure at the last financial year, and this is a small underspend, so it's not a huge change. It's a, it, it's a move in the right direction from where we were before, absolutely. And I commend the officers for doing that, but we, we don't want to oversell this um, because the potential overspend was midway through the financial year, not at the end of the last financial year. We just need to be absolutely clear on this. Well, I wouldn't like either to underestimate the, the hard work that, that members, the staff, at every level within the department have done. It's an absolutely sound and excellent achievement, and that's what we should strive, or that's where we should strive to be every year. Nobody's denying that, and I'd never for a moment said there was anything wrong with the effort and everything else that was getting been put into it over the last financial year. What I'm saying is we need to be absolutely accurate. It was a small overspend. It was about 20-odd thousand, if I remember correctly, and we're now... A, uh, roughly the same underspend. So, yes, it's good news, but it's not this earth-shattering news that you're actually uh, making it out to be, Chair, with all due respect. Well, with due respect, I think it's a lot of hard work and a good outcome. I've got David McKee and then Iva. I think, I think it's sad that Councillor Ferguson is uh, looking at it that way, and I think he's looking at it from a political point of view rather than the, the performance of the staff that we've got in social work. Social work over the years has always been a difficult budget to manage and for any uh, employees or any group in social work to bring the budget in close to or below uh, to make savings, I think they have to be congratulated. I don't think we're decrying any work previously done in any other year, but this year we've made a saving and that's, that's got to be recognised. I respect for where the starting line was. Thanks for that, Councillor McKee. Graham? Thanks very much, Chair. Yep, overall, really good news. But it's just regarding page 11 of 180. It's um, summary by locality. It's just regarding Annandale Nestale. It says the outturn um, for Annandale Nestale had seen an increase of 79,000. Um, just wonder why that is. If, if you haven't got them details on hand, um, could you just send me them off, offline? If that's you get that information offline, that will be absolutely fine, Graham. Ivor? Councillor Hislop. Yeah, it was to echo some of the sentiments Councillor McKee made. This has been two years of 
good performance by the staff um, to, to get that close to balancing the budget both years um, is difficult in a demand-led or a needs-led service. And I think you know, whether it was last year, this year, they've done well over the two years. And I congratulate all the staff on that. Thanks for that, Ivor. Ian? Thanks, Jim. Just, I'm trying to understand fully what the 3.8 adult services is. It was brought up earlier by Ivor in regards to... It sounds like folk are, are passing away and their, their property's been sold and that's where that charge is. It's like a back income. Is that correct or just exactly what is that? Maybe I'm completely misreading that. I'll get Colin to reply to that. It, potentially, yes. It's when um, a service user has sold their house, so potentially it could be, unfortunately, if they've passed away, or it could be because of the current market where they're able to uh, sell their house um, when they get a reasonable offer. Ian, I suppose it just, if, if that's the case, and it just it says that the likelihood of increasing that, I just wonder where does this trend come from? Why do we say that? Because it says it within 3.9 at the tail end of that paragraph. Colin again. If, if yeah, information is yeah. not there, I can so certainly take it at, at a later point, if that's the case. Paul, just find, find the, the... Sorry, it's page okay. 7, the top paragraph, just near the end, it says that it's an uh, increase in income for future years. That it's an uh, expectation. But I can take that information at a later point, if it's difficult to, to find it. Later point, point today are offline. Well, Colin's got it. I'll get it now, and that'll be it done. Paul, just sorry, just to find the exact word in the, in the document. It, it's basically is, uh, as we move more towards the number of clients that are coming through, the expectation is that more clients will start potentially going down this route of taking the charging orders. And as we go forward, we'll have to start anticipating and looking at more, uh, I wouldn't say accurate costs, but more planning and forecasting of achieving this as a regular income going forward and the likelihood it will move from the traditional invoicing route to the charging order to help people's home will be the likelihood we'll be going down in the future. Thanks, Ian. Any other member? Will I? Yeah, Chair, and before I'm attacked, you know, I would not demur from the, the excellent work being delivered by staff. Uh, and indeed, uh, if that is to try and bring budgets under, uh, into line, then, then staff should be uh, congratulated. But nevertheless, I think we've got to recognise the extreme pressure that uh, staff are working under to try and keep budgets into line and sometimes not deliver uh, the services that many of our service users on a needs-led budget uh, are receiving, and that's been my experience. And we've got to know, you know, not just part our, put our own hands behind our back and part them because it's become uh, we've brought the budget into line. But we've also got to be conscious of the service that we are delivering to the people, uh, very much vulnerable people, and those most in need, as indeed is our policy. Uh, or at least one of the four policies of, of, of this council. So yes, uh, we should congratulate staff, but we should also be looking at the extreme pressure many of them are working under, and indeed uh, where they are understaffed. And I've raised this issue on uh, numerous occasions uh, uh, with uh, the, the chief social worker and the new director of services. So in this respect here, we've also got to be conscious or the services we do deliver, uh, and that we're reaching maximum standards. Thanks, Willie. Uh, it goes without saying that on every occasion, unless uh, this committee change, the, the staff deliver direction we give them, and that direction has been followed, I would expect, to the letter. And as a consequence of that, we have achieved a budget. I think uh, it is a good news story. We've had over the years a lot of bad news stories in this committee, and it's pleasant reading for a change to see a positive a report in terms of the financial situation this committee finds itself in. Any other members? Ian? Yeah, man, if you'll indulge me, because when I read this type of report, it goes through my mind over the time because of the changes we're, we're undertaking at the moment. 
we jump forward a year, where it's a integration joint board is a large chunk of the budget we're looking at here. How will social work delve into this? How, what control do they have over it? Will it just be a monitoring type of overlook? Or how, what, what kind of, I'm still trying to understand that, Chairman, that's why I ask that. And just as, as I read more, more on, and it just, what, what will it look like this time next year as we're looking at these budgets? Because clearly we'll lose quite a degree of control over them. As it's a transitional year, we'll all be interested to see how it eventually plays out. We will have an influence. We will have members on the Integration Joint Board. You will be one of them, I understand. So you will have first-hand information and the opportunity to feed in and to feed back. Uh, control might be something different, but that will be fed back to this committee on a regular basis in a, a, I think we've agreed, a quarterly reporting mechanism. But uh, it's certainly not something we could enter into the discussion on today. I'm sure if you want to, or any member wants to learn a bit more about the process, about where we are at any stage in the process, Lillian and her team will be happy to provide that information and indeed visit groups to, to, to brief them on the progress we're making and the processes that are being employed. But I think that the, the, the final thing is, Ian, we will have an influence and we will have an input. And as five members of the committee, we will have an equal responsibility and an equal challenge to, to, to deliver the integrated joint board in, in an appropriate fashion. You want to go back? No, thanks so much for that, Chairman. It, it, it's uh, as I thought. So just because, and it wasn't so much that line I was thinking. I've got a, quite a grasp in regards to that. It's like so that say at 310, where we just agreed a strategic plan, a draft strategic plan at the Community Health and Social, Social Care Partnership Board, and we're moving away from institu institutionalised type of service to more community based. And I wonder, would that have an effect on a figure like that there? Can as we do move forward, and it used to try and get an understanding. Does this committee have a role to play? Is it totally in control of the integration joint board? So it's more around about that, Chairman. I may be thinking too far ahead at this moment, but it's certainly interesting. Aye, I think that that, that that will follow with the discussions that we have both integrate joint board level and here, Ian. Uh, and uh, I think we should let it go to now, and uh, you, you can maybe catch up with Lily and get an individual insight into what's going on. And the quarterly reports back to this committee will allow members to uh, investigate or delve more deeply into the, the mechanisms being employed and how the the money that we allocate to the, the whole of the, the, the new joint board will be best used. But, but thanks for your, your input. Okay. If that's the case, members, can we go to the recommendations? Two one that we have done the net underspend of nineteen thousand pounds. Two two this underspend has been transferred to earmark the committed funds as detailed in appendix two. Two three, the achievement of the agreed savings applied to twenty fifteen sixteen social work service budget at, at as reflected in Appendix 3, and the update in respect of the policy development budgets which were provided to the Social Work Service as reflected in Appendix 4. Thanks very much for that, members. And again, congratulations to Lynn and our team for the, the, the sterling work they've done. Come to Item 5, Social Work Services Budget 2015-16. And again, this is Lillian's report. Lillian, do you need to add to the report? Uh, clearly, we've um, tabled for members' consideration the proposals for social work services budget as detailed. Um, and again, Angela and Colin will take any um, points of clarity from members. Thank you. Okay, members, you have the information before you. Councillor Hislop. Chair, based on the fact that we had the uh, over recovery of 723,000. Take it out with the client contribution. What are we basing next year's figures on? What we had last year plus inflation uplift, or what we actually achieved plus an inflation uplift? Colin? Yes, what we did was um, this financial year, the same way that we set the non income budgets, we looked at the information that we had provided on the number of clients and the estimation for our like, increases. So we've done the exact same this year based on income. Uh, previous years was probably more aligned on. What? I'm so sorry, but when you turn away from the, um, if, so if you address the remarks to the chairman, you're speaking direct to the microphone, and then we can all hear, please. That's all right. Sorry. sorry. Um, previous years, we used to uh, realign the budget more likely on last year's income achievement. This financial year, we've based it more on information received through the Framework I system, based on client numbers uh, that are anticipated. Uh, ability to pay and take into account any kind of uplifts potentially for DWP element increases and things. So it's more based on activity 
rather than previous year's estimate. Thanks, Colin. And members, at the same time, we have these two amended pages, page 52 and page 84. If there are no, no others, then you'll be at Bennett. Ian? Yeah, just on page um, 41 out of 180, I'm just um, interested in the, the transport costs there. That's a, a hugely substantial reduction. Uh, how, how are you achieving that? It goes from a budget out of 14, 15 uh, of almost three quarters of a million down to uh, 359,000 for the estimate for 15, 16. It's quite Colin. a remarkable drop. I'm not complaining about it, but how do think we've managed it? I hope it's used to pull cars, but Colin? Yes, sorry. There's two elements. There is a small element of saving that's been attached to that budget with a region of about £50,000 from last year, sorry, £60,000 from last financial year. The bulk of what the rest of it relates to like a year-end recharge for pool cars. So, so at year-end, uh, the costs are apportioned to what the service have utilised from central support, and that accounts for potentially in the region of about 300000 so that will get allocated at the end of the financial year. So it's not actually a reduction, it's just at the year end when we know what costs are allocated to each service, that will get put in the social budget, if that makes sense. Yeah. Happy with that, Ian. Okay, Chair, could I just add on to that, that we're reviewing the, the use of pool cars within the service and trying to improve value for money and, and how we make best use of those throughout the region. So that's something that's ongoing at the moment. Thanks for that. Thanks, Angela. Okay, members. In that case, if we can go to the recommendations on item five. Members are asked to review and agree the social work services budget 2015-16 is detailed in appendix two to this report. Members agree that. And note that work is being progressed to integrate activity-based budget information and business planning information, thus removing the need for separate documents and providing an improved understanding of unit costs of producing a service and more sophisticated resource profiling. Happy to note. Thank you. Right, members, we'll come to item six, and there has been a, an amended paper distributed amongst members. Since some members haven't received that until this very minute, I propose to give two minutes time, members, just to have a quick study. I, I can tell you that the, the, the important changes are on 3.18, 3.20, and 3.32. Relatively modest but significant changes. So 3.18, 3.20, and 3.32. That's the only change to the original document circulated amongst members. So just have a couple of minutes to let members study it.
members happy they've had enough time to study the document, given that there were only minor changes in three of the paragraphs within the whole document. I presume you've already documented earlier in proceedings in any case. Shall we go on with the report? Okay. Thank you, members. This is item six, external scrutiny of social work services, January to May 2015. Councillor Ian Blake has asked to speak to members on this item, and I've acceded to that request. The normal process is that reports presented, members ask questions, and then Councillor Blake invited to speak and he'll stay at the table in case members have any specific questions for him. What I would say is this is not a report on Dunmuir Park, although it's contained within the external scrutiny report for members here. The Dunmuir Park report is scheduled to come before you at the next meeting, provided Price Waterhouse Cooper gives us the information we've requested. And I've told a, a Graham and Lillian that I'm not prepared to accept a report that's not complete and comprehensive because I think members are entitled to have that before them. There will be a discussion at that stage. So provided we have that information, the report will come to you in August. So on that basis, I wouldn't want a lengthy discussion on Dunmuir Park itself, other than to discuss the element of the inspection that forms part of the overall report. And if I can just go to the body of the report, where three one, you will see the changes. The prog it, it relates to progress, 318. Plans have now been completed or are in progress for all existing and new service users. We have carried out the, the plan, but some service users or legal guardians representing service users have not signed off the plans and found them acceptable, hence the change in the wording of the document. The work has been carried out by staff, but they're not signed off by service users. On that basis, we can present the plans as complete. And you'll see later on in the, the paper in 320, plans have Reviews have been completed on seven service users. That leaves three service users where that review is at this stage incomplete. That's why the, the report is before you and amended. And in 332, this is included within the new service users' care and support plans. Most carers and service users have signed these documents as appropriate. That also acknowledges that fact within the paper. Councillor Maitland. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, well, I, I welcome the changes because I think that was um, important to have in front of us um, because it was clear from the information which we were receiving was that um, that the original report was not strictly accurate. Um, that having said, I'd like to know just in terms of fact because I notice uh, and I do understand, Chairman, you and I had some correspondence on this and uh, you told me that the report was coming in August and I'm totally satisfied that, that is the right time uh, to deal with the um, detailed issues with respect to Dunmuir Park. Um, could you tell me on uh, 320 um, what percentage seven rec uh, is, is of the service users um, and will the, um, will the assessment uh, be, be done by the next inspection on everybody? Will that, that be completed? Will that be ready and done? By the next I'll inspection. ask Heather to reply, but I think the assessment has been done in 10. It's done in everyone, but because some representatives are not satisfied with the way that it's been done, they've no signed it. So in, in theory, if they never sign it, the thing will never be complete. It's about engagement and a, 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 a joint agreement on the end product that currently we don't have. But Heather, can you maybe just address it's that now? What's oh, Colin? Okay, sorry, Colin. Uh, <clears throat> there's actually nine uh, like people who are living um, in the park. Um, the um, assessments are getting completed uh, by um, a combination of, of, of ways, which is the, we've brought in the assessment and review team who are supporting the locality social work team to complete the, the assessment process. But I think the question was as well, what happens if these documents are not signed? But no matter, apparently that's not an appropriate question at this juncture, so we'll just leave it as 
Well, <clears throat> well, it was just a question of whether the work is done, whether it's signed off, that the whole thing is done, it's laid out um, uh, and, and there to be achieved. So that, that's what I understand the case to be. Because I'm interested in as far as, as that the work is there, everything's laid out because our responsibility is to do what we can um, before the inspectorate comes in so that uh, we have, 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 have gone as far as we possibly can and our duty to make certain that the council goes as far as it can. So I'm really asking whether that piece of work will be achieved insofar as the council can. Absolutely. We, as far as we are concerned, have discharged our duty. And Lillian will answer yes or no to that question. I can answer yes in terms of we're taking it forward um, in terms of engagement and undertaking the work we can with the service users. But we appreciate that there are some elements um, that we still have to address and we're working to do that. Stephen and then Andy. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's actually on uh, table three on page 122 uh, and the requirement at 3.50. Um, so when I'm looking at that, I'm, I'm trying to sort of understand fully what a responsible person is in this situation. And whenever we're appointing somebody at such an establishment, um, would we... Are we to expect them to be fully trained in order to be a responsible person at the establishment prior to their appointment, or whenever they're there, they become trained sufficiently to be a responsible? I'm just sort of wondering about that order of things, because I would have thought, maybe naively, that before you're actually appointed, you would be trained to the required level in order to be um, a responsible person at that particular residential uh, institution. But what I'm looking at that in terms of the recommendation is that not all staff were at that and they're subsequently getting trained while they're there. So it's really just to understand that. Lily, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that for you, Stephen. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. I mean, clearly um, some circumstances would dictate that staff have been transferred into particular posts within the service. We have um, ongoing training induction um, and we're... Um, absolutely clear that staff have a professional development training program within all social work services and um, this residential unit would be no exception to that. So they may come with a level of training but are always required refresher and professional development training as legislation and other um, aspects of social work services change. Stephen. Thanks. So um, I, I appreciate that but I'm just sort of thinking this is a requirement so I'm just thinking are we Okay, so it's, it's been done, right, okay, thank you. Andy, I missed Ivor, if you don't mind. Uh, I, my apologies, I'm just not paying attention to what Lucy's doing. Ivor? Chair, it's going back to the two requirements. Now, it, my understanding, they haven't been signed off. Are we delivering the service to these vulnerable people? And are we covering ourselves there? Because if you haven't agreed a scheme, how can you deliver that service? Or are we still working on a service, previous service, that doesn't reflect the needs, the current needs of the client? And as such, how do we get out of that situation whereby we might be deemed as acting against the best interest? Lillian? Confident at the present time that we are meeting the requirements of the service users within uh, Dunmuir Park. I'm happy for Colin to, to give you more detail on that, but in terms of the frontline service which the vulnerable adults are receiving, then I'm confident that they're safe, secure, and receiving the appropriate support. As far as I can see, and every, it's not just Dunmuir Park this reports about, and I realise members are focused on that, there is good responses from the inspection with one exception, and there is one requirement placed in it. So wouldn't they want to the, have this change direction somehow and be an investigation at Dunmuir Park. We will have plenty of opportunity in August. This is about the scrutiny of social work services journey to me on a number of facilities, and there's only one that rated less than good, and that's a two, and there's a, one requirement placed on us to, to, to rectify that. Andy. Um, thanks, Chair. <clears throat> uh, for those in the room who don't understand 
the legal definition of responsible person. Can we actually get that clarified? Because I think that was one of Stephen's questions. Um, the second thing is that if we can't get resolution with um, either the service user or their uh, representative, what other remedies are available to this council? That will come, and we'll answer the second question, that will come in August, but certainly legal definition is something that will be helpful, but uh, all the questions related to service users, etc., etc., will be dealt with in August, specific meeting, when this report will come, and that should enlighten members as to where we are and what we can and cannot do. But as far as legal definition is concerned, Heather, please. Yeah, I can give you the legal definition in terms of responsible um, person, but I want to make sure that I get the wording absolutely right. So if I can um, convey that to you after the meeting, if that's okay, and send it straight through. I'd like to just check it that we're, rather than you get my words, you get the words from the regulation. So we're absolutely clear that the meaning is, is as it should be. In that case, Heather, would to every member, please, of this committee, uh, and you might as well incorporate it in the report in August, the legal definition of a responsible person, and that way we have it in a, a written format and we don't need to rely on, on recollection or, or emails that's floating around, but I'd be grateful if you do that for everybody, Heather, please. Hey, Jane, you wanted to come back in? I did, because I wanted to talk about Hardthorn Road. Um, uh, what I wanted to ask, please, is um, the issue in 3.61, um, and this has been a bit of a hobby horse of mine. Uh, I was always a bit concerned that we built our own um, facilities um, because there's a danger that you then fill them, um, whether or not it's absolutely correct for the rest, you know, for the mix of, of the inhabitants of um, any particular um, uh, home. And um, I notice that in 361, uh, the bullet point at the bottom, um, ensuring that this, this is reviewing policy and procedures, ensuring that this can be achieved without adversely affecting the service provided to other young people. Now, what I'd be interested in knowing is, um, just as a sort of rough guidance, how many people have you actually said, no, we cannot place in Hawthorne Road because it will not be right for the others? Lillian? The Councillor Maitland, I'm happy to get the exact numbers, but um, certainly since the, um, the turn of the year, we've refused six young people going into Hawthorne Road because it would have a negative effect, um, and four going into Cairn Ryan, but I will absolutely give you the accurate figures, but that's my understanding. Jane. I find that a reassuring um, uh, number. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would all members like that information as well? I think when we're sharing information with individuals of the committee, it's simpler just to make sure everybody gets them. And in that way, it, it will all be equally informed. Jane did want to come back in, Andy, and then I'll come to you. I realise it's the same point. That's absolutely fine, uh, Chairman. I, I do find that reassuring. Thanks, Jane. Same point then, Stephen. Andy? Um, yeah, same time, Lillian. Can you tell us whether it was uh, detrimental to the young person or to the others in the house? William. I'm certainly happy to do that, Councillor Ferguson. We felt that the impact um, on the, uh, the young people that were already settled within the unit um, and also for the young person themselves going into an environment, the, the, the situation in the west of the region was that there was some territorial issues that the young person would have had some difficulty with someone who was already placed there. So it was for their own protection as well as um, un the unsettlement of the unit. So I guess both, but I can again give you a kind of broad outline. I would clearly not give you full detail, but I'll give you a broad outline. Thanks, Andy. Stephen? Thanks again, Chair. Um, so just on table four for Hardthorne Road, um, we've got the grade in June 2014. I mean, this is just taking it at face value. They're all at, sitting at four, and then in October, it's they're all at three. Um, so I was just wondering what, you know, could that be sort of explained, you know, why that should be such a, a jet? A, a sort of overall change there. And also, similarly, um, 3.58, it's actually got one of the recommendations. Uh, it talks about resolving current differences over the services, functions, and objectives. Um, and I was just wanting to under, you know, get a wee bit of clarity on that. Thank you. Lillian, please. Uh, Councillor Thompson, what, what happened, um, we had unfortunately prior management had submitted a report to the care inspector in terms of the registration of the unit. 
which hadn't gone through either the senior management team um, and hadn't been agreed, but it had been submitted. So when that came to light through this inspection, then we um, accepted that there was a, a difference in the agreement of the function, and it was around the 72-hour assessment. Because when a young person is admitted to a residential unit on an emergency basis, it's unlikely that you'll conclude a, a full assessment in 72 hours. So that's the, that was the issue in terms of the, um, the difference, the current difference. So we have changed that and resubmitted registration to the care inspectorate, and I would be confident when they return that that will be fully implemented. In terms of the, the difference in grades, we've changed the um, focus on the young people that we are trying to use our two residential units to um, host. We have started to bring some young people back from external placements, and some of the difficulty has been um, we've had quite a significant turnover in staff as we've tried to move to a more stable residential service for our looked after and accommodated young people. The manager um, has moved on, so consequently we've had a, 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 quite a significant turnover and we've had to, to look at some additional support. And my view would be that was the impact in terms of some of those gradings, but we're starting to move to a much more stable residential process now. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, members? Hey, Councillor Scobie and then Gail. Yeah, Chair, and I'm sure you'll appreciate it's a very difficult uh, note to, to stray into, indeed, what is to be a report, uh, as you rightly say, I think, about the August September time. But when we look at uh, some of these issues that are before us today, uh, dated the uh, 30th of June, uh, the requirements in particular, well, we're looking at requirement one, uh, then uh, the provider must ensure the care that care plans reflect how service users will be supported to achieve their desired outcome from uh, supports provided in accordance with their assessed needs and appropriate monitoring review. And the time scale given to that particular one is within six weeks on publication of this report. Now, I, I refer back to, uh, or I refer to, uh, the number of emails that we receive regarding the, the dissatisfaction of uh, the families the, the, the legal guardians, etc. Uh, 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 and this is almost saying, you know, or not recognising indeed the time that has been taken to deal with this issue uh, and many of the other issues. Uh, and this one gives a six week period. Another one gives a six month in terms of 3.39 under the, the requirement under quality of management and leadership. Uh, and again, there is one that actually talks about a prompt uh, in the requirement. Chair, can we have the, 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 the assurance, or at least the, 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 some kind of confidence, that these issues are being dealt with, and being dealt with in terms of the care being provided to uh, the residents, and that their, guardian, their legal guardians or, or family are, are being satisfied with, 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 with the outcome? That uh, would enable us to, to, to monitor the progress that's going on. In terms of Dunmuir Park response on page 122350, it tells you the requirement is, and then 351 tells you the progress that's been completed. Staff are dealing with this issue, and any discussion on Dunmuir Park will be kept until the report comes before members in a lengthy report or discussion can be held. Councillor McGregor and then Councillor Dick. Thank you, Chair. Just a very brief point, um, picking up on Councillor Maitland's question. Um, six were refused placement at Hardthorne and three at Cairn Ryan's, uh, four, four, sorry. Where do those young people go if, if they've been refused from those placements on, on a very correct basis? Um, but where, where are they sitting now? Well, um, Clearly, there'd be a mixture of um, identified resources, could be for intensive fostering, or we could use an external provider, um, or indeed we put um, a significant amount of support around a family member to assist them to, to um, maintain that young person within their own community. So it would be a range of, of um, other areas of support that we would identify. Councillor Dick. Thanks, Chair. Just, just in relation to, I know, um, uh, Councillor Thompson has asked specifically about drops in, in reporting standards, but 
when the administration changeover, there was a, there was a relatively small um, uh, over overspend, uh, but better inspection reports. Can you give us an assurance that, in general, uh, that the inspection reports, the drop it, the drop in standards is, um, that has been uh, been been highlighted, is not to do with uh, the budget um, uh, rather than service uh, quality? Is uh, the the fact that we have a, an underspend now? Uh, no relation to to any drop in standard. Just really would like that assurance. I think it should be a given that you know. I think every member will that assurance that we are no making savings and and placing people at risk of providing a poorer service because of that. But Lillian, a yes or no would be fine. Yes, I can give you that assurance. Thanks, Ian. Okay, members. In that case, we have Councillor Blake looking to. Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Haslip again. Uh, similar question across from Councillor Dix, but within Table 3, Table 4 and Table 5 there are previous gradings. Could you tell us, were those unannounced visits or announced visits? Because it does show a slight drop and I notice most of the secondary ones are unannounced and I wouldn't like to think that it's a case that if we know they're coming, we up our game uh, for that inspection. Lillian, uh, Lillian I'm sure they were all unannounced, but Heather, can you just deal with that, please? Yeah, my recollection in terms of the reports that you had previously were that the vast majority were unannounced. Um, in fact, the vast majority of all of our inspections are unannounced, um, and it is only a very small number. So, I mean, I can go back and absolutely check to be certain, but I mean, my recollection, would, I'm sure, would say that they were unannounced visits. So I don't think the difference was to do with with the nature of the, the inspection itself. Thanks for that, Heather. Okay, uh, Councillor Blake, as local member for Castle Douglas, wants to say a few words. Uh, that'll be words, not Castle Douglas. Correct you, Chairman. Chairman th and members, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on this paper today. I promise I won't be brief, as I, I realise you've got quite a lot to deal with. Before I start, you mentioned during item four that it was a good news story, and I always suggest that this item is not a good news story. Today, uh, I'll follow your instructions and only refer to the element of the care inspection, although it's important that the members remember there are significant other issues involved at Dunyweir Park, and it's very difficult to, to separate them from this issue. However, I won't do that. Without attempt to pass judgment on these very highly complicated issues, there's no doubt that throughout this entire issue, errors have and still continue to be made. The reissue of this paper today following a challenge from the family, only supports this view. You mentioned that there were minor changes. I would suggest that they weren't actually minor changes. They total, totally changed the reflection of the report. We spoke earlier about the, the difference between announced visits and unannounced visits. It's interesting to see that the announced visits tend to get a good grading. Where unannounced, we go into weak and adequate. And I really think that needs to be looked at. I think it's time now that we must ask ourselves why the care inspectorate identified such serious requirements and recommendations in the first place, and why the recommendations have still not been completed more than six months later. The areas covered, or the, these covered areas such as quality of care and support, quality of staffing, quality of management and leadership, and I'm sure you'll agree that these are all highly important areas. If we look at the progress on an inspection that took place last year, the three requirements that were made still really haven't been fully complied with, together with other recommendations. Over the, the past 14 months and, and more, especially since external inspection last, last year, I have tried to keep up to date with the issue, but I find it increasingly difficult to do so. Almost two weeks ago, I made a, a request to the corporate management team asking for a briefing on all of the outstanding issues. I have to report today that I have still not received a response to that. I'm sure that I don't need to remind you that you as members of the Social Work Committee have a duty of scrutiny. However, I feel that, that this has now become so complicated that as a routine agenda item on a normal business day, this cannot possibly do proper justice scrutiny to this issue. I ask today that you consider setting up an ad hoc subcommittee 
with the sole remit to closely scrutinise and report back on the issues, on all of the issues surrounding Dunmuir Park, but in particular today, this the care issue element. In addition to this, when the matter is eventually considered to be closed, I request that the entire issue be referred to the Audit and Risk Committee, as I personally feel that the reputation of this Council may have been placed at risk. Thank you for your attention, and I sincerely hope that, for the sake of transparency and openness, that you give my suggestion serious consideration. Thank you. Thanks for that, Councillor Blake. Uh, uh, we'll not have any questions to you in relation to that, because it deals specifically with Dunmuir Park. Uh, no particular happy with some of the, the observations you've made. I don't think it's useful or helpful to criticise staff in any circumstance. However, uh, we have had your uh, a presentation today, and members may want to consider that request at some stage in the future. Personally, it's not something I would have endorsed at all. I think every member of this committee has the same duty to discharge in relation to any function of social work services. No delegate it to some subcommittee, and if members of this council feel strong enough and take it to full council and remove the delegation from social work services, then so be it. But in the meantime, it's not something again I, I, I would want to consider. But thank you for your presentation. I'm sure members will dwell on that over the next month or so, and it will no doubt still be fresh in their minds when we meet in August, and hopefully at that stage, the the full report on Dunmuir Park will be present for members to debate. Okay, can we go to the recommendations? Members are asked to note the positive outcome of scrutiny activity during this period. Consider the progress being made in respect of the requirements and recommendations from inspection during the reporting period. Consider the future progress made in respect of requirements and recommendations noted from previous reports for services with grades below good. Councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chair, I would like to take uh, cognizance of what uh, Councillor Blake has said uh, in respect of uh, an ad hoc, notwithstanding uh, your own personal uh, views on this, and that as we are to receive a, a, a full report, I would like to give consideration to, uh, and indeed move, that we do set up an ad hoc subcommittee to, to give uh, greater in-depth uh, scrutiny of this particular issue uh, at, at Dunmuir Park. It's something that, that uh, along the lines I moved at a previous social work committee uh, meeting when we considered it. And again, I think it is worthy to give justice to, to the issue. It has been going on for, for some time, uh, 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 as I try to uh, portray in my remarks, in terms of the time taken. And I think as members, we, we, we do need to look at it whether it's an ad hoc or, or, or all 14, uh, or members 19, if it is, uh, then that should be done. Uh, and to move away from uh, perhaps set procedure, but even uh, invite uh, families along just to hear what the, the issues are, given that uh, Councillor Blake has already said he's, he's presented it to the corporate management team and still waiting on what the, the issues are. So, therefore, Chair, I would move that we do look at the uh, setting up an ad hoc subcommittee to consider done your part. Given that the report's coming in the next meeting of this committee, it's not something I'm prepared to accept, Councillor Scobie. Councillor Hedlock. Chair, I have a feeling that once we have the fullest of information, that would be the time to make the decision with regard to the subcommittee. We don't have that just now. I have concerns that you said that Hopefully, coming in August, the report that depends on Price Cooper Waterhouse, what Cooper, whatever they call them. Um, and I would like to know how we are going to make sure that that report with the fullest of information is here in August, and we don't come back in August with a well priced PWC. PWC, I find that is come back and say, actually, well, we haven't got the information for you yet. I, how are we going to make sure that there is a meeting with that paper in August? And then at that stage, I think that would be the time if we need to have a special meeting of this committee to actually address the one issue. Uh, that's when we should look at. PWC have said that we will have their report in our possession mid-July. 
which is why we said it would be ready for August. If you want reports that are not 100% accurate and don't have enough detailed information that you should have before you, I can do that, but I think it would be far more constructive if we have all the information before us at the time we make any kind of decision. And remember as well, it's not every individual and every family have an issue with this particular facility. It's some, and we are impacting on their well-being and their welfare as well if we get this wrong. Councillor Ferguson. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, having sat where you're sitting, um, I agree with you regarding the PwC report and the report coming in August. Um, however, I also think there's merit in what Councillor Blake is saying about some ad hoc or some subcommittee to then oversee any actions that have come out of the PwC report. So I would support your recommendation, obviously, to you to actually take the report in, in early, uh, late summer and from there on move it forward. And I think that would be the way to address Ian's concerns about, because this could end up taking up the whole time of the whole social work committee. And whilst it's extremely serious, there are other equally serious things that need to be uh, dealt with um, through this committee. So I would hate for this to become the focus of this committee for the foreseeable future. And I think it's a sensible suggestion to, 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 to go we are uh, representative of the, all the political parties or a subgroup after we've got the big report in August. Thanks for that. I take it we'll decide that when the time comes, but I would not want to exclude any member from any decision-making process involved in this committee, which would be defeated if you had created a subcommittee. Councillor Carruthers? I think decisions are best made with the fullest information. I think what Willie's put forward is merit uh, some strength and some strength but in regards to it maybe it's better with the fullest information. I do think you, the, the, crit the critical side of what you said about Councillor Blake criticising the members of staff I thought was untrue. I thought you maybe criticised the council in regards to this but not the staff so I don't think your words were chosen very well. If there's criticism directed in public it's to members of staff because they deliver the service that we, we, we instruct them to do so indirectly it's criticism of staff. But anyway, I'm not going to engage in that particular debate. I think we're talking about a, fair, a fairly serious issue. I don't think anybody's casting blame at anybody at this stage. All we're looking for is an absolute opportunity to scrutinise it properly, whether it be members, staff, or whatever. We're all accountable to the public. Um, and I'm not going to protect any member in this chamber or any member of staff to that. I think we need a full report in August, and then we'll take it forward from there. But skirting around the issue is, is not helpful. No, and, and discussions like this are not helpful either. But anyway, that's fine. If we can leave it at that and get the report in August and deal with the matters that arise as a consequence of that, I think that would be useful. Members happy with that? Good. Thanks for that. Go to item seven. Director's End of Year Assessment and Business Plan Performance, Social Work Services 2014-15. William, have you anything to add to your report? I would just like to um, advise members that we are looking at the performance information that we provide. Some of the information is historical and will be static, so we do need to review to ensure that members get full relevant information to allow you to fully monitor the process of the service. Thank you. Okay, members, Councillor Maitland. Um, yes, thank you. Um, page 147, it's the, um, the promoting the wider use of power of attorney, um, with which I am in full agreement. I don't know whether I've got to express an interest. I've actually got power of attorney. Uh, my parents did that long time ago. Um, <clears throat> but um, I, I, I want to know, will that involve a sort of short-term um, increase in resource to attempt to, to get people to think ahead, um, which I think would be enormously beneficial to, to the person involved, to the family, to everybody, to, uh, to, look, to look at that. I don't know whether I'm uh, misunderstanding the situation, but it, it seems to me that would be a kind of spend-to-save um, project. Thanks, Jean Graham. We'll deal with that. 
we are going to create a statutory mental health team. Um, one of the, the primary bits round about that will be trying to work with other teams and other colleagues throughout health, GPs, etc., to try and get them to think about using more preventative as opposed to the guardianship, which is reactive. That's almost like after the event. If we can move to that preventative stage, we should see a rise in power of attorney. I, I'm not going to say that, that that will be balanced by a drop in guardianships. I just think that the number of, of older people that we've got coming through without capacity now, that may take some time to, to actually see a balance. We may see an uplift in powers of attorney, but equally we may see also see an uplift in guardianships. <clears throat> well, I mean, perhaps that's something we should actually really take a look at as a, as a committee, um, if it's going to put pressure, um, if, it, if it might have an opportunity of producing pressure. But um, I, I, I defer to you, Chairman, as to whether or not we put a marker against that one as something that, as a committee, we might look at. Yeah. Graham? Just to add to that, there's a new mental health bill going through Scottish Parliament at, the, at this moment in time. If that brings in graded guardianships, um, that may alleviate some of some of the work that goes with the existing full guardianship application. Good, Jane. Stephen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, there's a couple of points just in the exception reports. Uh, page one four six, the PDRs for staff. Um, performance development reviews. So I'm just looking at the, I mean, obviously there's a, a clear drop for the 2014-15 and I'm just noticing an, an improvement action at number three. Um, staff who do not have an up-to-date PDR will have to have one scheduled in the diary and all outstanding PDRs completed by June 2015. And that's kind of like today. So where are we with that? Um, and I'll take an answer to that and then I'll come back from a second question if you like. Thank you. Okay, Lillian. Yeah, Councillor Thompson, thank you for that question. Um, the PDRs are all scheduled for staff, and I would be confident when we come back with our updated report in September, you'll see a significant increase. They are scheduled. Thanks, thank you. And, thank you. And the second uh, question is on home care hours on page uh, 153. Um, now, this seems to be uh, a sort of perennial problem over the last few years, but we seem to really struggle meeting this target, and although the demographic seems to indicate that the need's going to increase, the numbers are going down. So, you know, I appreciate this is a complex issue and it spans a number of services, etc. but um, can you provide a wee bit more that's in the paper there? Because it's, uh, I, I don't really see how this is getting turned around. Thank you. I think, I think there's a number of issues um, as you rightly point out, first of all is the way that we've previously reported it. Secondly of all is the uptake in self-directed support wouldn't necessarily be counted through this. Thirdly, um, over 65s now, um, if we did it for over 75s, I think you would probably find that that, that was a much higher target. And the other bit um, is that it's not, this is a regional figure. If you look at it in localities, you see some quite distinct differences um, between localities and the, the, the performance figures there. Um, the home care market um, is under pressure. Um, even if we had the money, there isn't the workforce there. Um, and if we had the workforce at the moment, we don't have the money. Um, but there are actually very few people waiting on home care. That's, that's the reality of it. We are actually able to manage what's coming through largely reasonably well. There are some notable exceptions to that, and that can be um, for a whole variety of reasons and right across the region, um, depending upon what day or week it is. So there's a number of issues in that that we are trying to better understand, but this is a national target. This is a nationally set target. Stephen. Yeah, thanks for letting me back in. So just one of the things in your response there, which I felt was pertinent, was um, the number of people actually waiting for home care, which obviously through your reflections, that was the key thing. So if, as long as there isn't a backlog of people waiting for that service, that's the important measurement in a sense. And I appreciate there's a national 
target, but should we really be able to consider uh, the fact that we're actually meeting the outcomes of what we're setting out to do, and that uh, is there a way we can actually have a more meaningful measurement? Because clearly that, that measurement in itself doesn't reflect the complexity of the issue, when what we really want to know is, does everybody who needs it get it? Okay. I'm sure that's data that we can get you on a, on a regular basis, if that's what you would like. And I'm sure we could probably do that by locality. Happy with that. We'll do that, members. Okay, thanks for that, Graham. Hey, I've got Ian Dick, Ian Carr, and Ian Willing. Uh, the, the specifics have already been, been covered at page 146, but just as an observation, this has always perplexed me ever since I first came onto the Council. Um, at one point, um, we, we didn't seem to have um, any regularised performance appraisals. Uh, I mean, I've spent most of my working life in the private sector, and you got a performance appraisal every year, and 100% of staff got a, a performance appraisal every year. I cannot for the life of me understand why we have percentages of anything less than 100 in any department or, or, or uh, anywhere within the Council of a performance appraisal being taking place once a year. Lillian. Uh, absolutely, Councillor Dick, we uh, agree with that. There will always be a small percentage, that may be that workers would be off long-term sick, for exa example, uh, but we are absolutely clear that that would be our commitment, that every single member of staff will have a PDR. Thanks, Jeannie and Carruthers. Certainly, I'll be passive in my approach to this because when I first opened up the papers and read it, it's like a 50 50 plan, which I don't think I've ever seen as many as kind of it is low across. I certainly just put every committee on the council, and when I first seen it, so it's easy to, to be critical, and that's why I'm not going to be over critical and, and take a passive approach. But in broad terms, because you touched on it, I think you touched on it earlier, Lillian, when you said that there's maybe performance indicators need to be looked at and so on and so forth. I wonder if you could have put more meat in the bones, and because, like I say, it's very critical when you look at it in broad terms, 50-50, I've never seen that before. I don't think, just as kind of look quite serious in regards to that. So I wonder if you could just add some meat to the bones, and Ken, how do you feel these will be addressed over the over forthcoming year? Lillian? Um, absolutely, um, except that, that this doesn't reflect the, the way that we're trying to uh, take social work services forward. Um, I, I said to members, and I'm certainly not in any way um, abdicating abdicate responsibility, this goes up to 31st of March 2015. New management team, fairly new in post then. So we have, over the past seven, eight months, um, absolutely looked at every single performance indicator, and we believe that a lot of this information is static, which will not change. So we'll continue to reflect... Um, that we're, that we're not performing as well as we should be. And what we want to try and give to elected members is much more up-to-date, um, relevant performance information. We're developing a whole new suite um, of information indicators so that members will have an absolute clear view on what we're delivering in social work services. We would hope, come September's report, that we will be able to give you a much more robust breakdown from the 1st of April um, and that you'll start to see the reflection in the changes. We have had to make significant changes in social work service, service delivery um, s since we came into post last August. So I absolutely accept a lot of this needs to change and we need to be more robust in, in providing you with up-to-date and accurate information, not reflecting some of these indicators rely on historical information which is static and will not change. You want to come back in? Just on, on one small point, because I mean, when, when we considered item four, I wasn't, I wasn't going to be critical of that, because it's a positive keeping of financial management in, in hand. But has that had any reflection in regards to this, or do you think it's more in regards to what, to what you're saying? It's more about performance indicators, that information being out of date, I think is what you're saying. I'm absolutely clear it's not the financial issue. It's about how we've reported, how we've gathered information, scrutinised information, and monitored the service. So I'm... Um, um, confident that we'll come back with a much more robust set of performance indi indicators which will give you a much clearer reflection on the service we're delivering. Thanks, Ian. Andy? Um, thanks, Chair. Um, page 152, the community payback orders. Can we get the percentage of service uh, user non-compliance and staff illness? Because it's an unfair um, measure if we don't take those into account. Lillian? 
Um, again, again, Councillor Ferguson, I would be confident that we'll be able to give you a much more robust breakdown on the impact. So currently we've not gathered that information um, and we're currently reviewing the whole of the unpaid work service and also the impact of the, the areas recognised. Thanks, Andy. Willie? Yeah, Chair, it's to build on what Ian has just raised, you know, and it's not just 50%, it's 10 uh, that have not uh, reached targets, notwithstanding uh, what Lillian says in terms of how it is reported back in a review of, of, of the performance. We have issues here where, uh, you know, I need the assurance or, or, or at least to be confident that people are not being put at risk. Uh, like, for instance, the, the exception reports, adult sport and protection strategy discussion meetings held within agreed timescales in line with the policies and procedures. Uh, 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 and uh, we've seen, you know, a, a, a figure of a target of 90 percent. Uh, you know, it, it's down to 70 uh, from from 2012-13. So within that, then, then, then something has uh, has got worse over that period. Uh, and again, in terms of the number of children that have three or more placements, uh, uh, significantly, you know, in, in, uh, increased and, and status is, is there not being met. And then I look at the the page one hundred and forty three in terms of sickness absence, you know, has risen to 6.32%, uh, where target of four, so rather than being on, on the decrease, it, it's seriously on the increase. And, and again, uh, you know, item four has been referred to, uh, and the partner, you know, or the backs, or how wonderful what the, 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 the social work has done in terms of bringing it into budget, but is there a correlation uh, between working with, uh, within budgets and the extreme pressure that staff are being put under where they are working understaffed or, or understaffed? Uh, 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 and I believe that to be the case in the West, uh, where I've continually asked for extra resources uh, to address the issue of uh, sickness absence. and, and I am sure the people who are the recipients of the service may not share the, 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 the item four with this committee or indeed the council in terms of service delivery. And we've got to look at what, what is the correlation, people going off sick, others having to pick, pick up more casework, and how we're addressing that to, to, to reduce that to 6.2. So is there a correlation there? Lillian. Uh, Councillor Scobie, I'll answer your points um, in order. In terms of staffing resources, we have increased the staffing capacity within the West by one senior social worker and two social workers, and that's currently out for recruitment. So we have recognised the need to increase the, the resources in terms of children and families, and that's currently out for advert. So we would hope through the normal recruitment po uh, process that we would be able to fill those um, post. We absolutely accept that the absence has increased um, and I think as we make changes to the service um, and you know there's, there's significant challenges in the national agenda and also the increased working process within social work um, then we need to deal with the absence much more effectively and um, we haven't really been very uh, forthcoming in, in, in helping staff back to work or indeed looking at some of the issues and, and as we move on to the next item um, we'll give you a bit more detail on that. Um, in terms of the children and the three or more placements, that will never change. That is a historic measurement because that is in the past, the process that we did used to, to move children about significantly. We have um, did a, a significant amount of work over the last six months to try and prevent those moves. Um, and that, that historical figure will not change, which is why I think we need to be much more robust at giving you up to date and more accurate information as we as we move through the review of residential um, services for looked after and accommodated children. And in terms of the adult support and protection, I'll ask Graham just to give you an update on that one. Graham, the adult support and protection stuff is about um, about strategy meeting, um, and that's basically where where we're not doing that. That's down to the availability of um, key people to actually be able to do that. 
we are going to be changing our processes to be more in line with childcare. So we do not have to have strategy meetings per se, and, and, and in fact, we can actually have um, IRDs, initial referral discussions, and we can do that by phone. So that that will that will get us over that bit, but nobody's been left at risk. Thanks for that, uh, Dave McKee. Hi, Chair. It's on page 151. The percentage of ch children looked after leaving care who have entered education, training, or employment. That's a desperately low percentage. Could you clarify exactly why it's as low and what uh, these children are, are now doing, given that there's no unemployment and etc.? Pauline? Uh, we're certainly working with uh, colleagues in lifelong learning and community development along with DWP to, to see if we can address some of these issues. And it's um, a part of the corporate parenting strategy, which um, is being discussed at the corporate parenting board, which some elected members within this committee are also members of. So we're aware of it. We're working um, to, to see what we can do to assist young people as they move through their journey um, from looked after and accommodated back into... To, uh, citizens within Dumfries and Galloway. So we've, we have a fair amount of work to do to address that, but we're certainly working with colleagues to, to support them. Jane Maitland. Um, it was really just a, a factual question with respect to um, the issue of uh, absence. Um, is there a geographical pattern to this? I mean, is it quite clear that there are more problems in particular areas? It would be helpful to know. I mean, again, looking at the next item, the next report. Lillian? Um, I, I don't have that information directly to hand, but again, I could um, have that distributed to all members. Absolutely. Given we're moving with Integrated Joint Board to locality management, we might ask in the future if that type of information could be given to members in a locality style presentation so that we can scrutinise what areas that are, are pressurised and whatever else might we need to do. To resolve that, a eh, councillor Dick, then councillor Simon, councillor. Uh, thanks, Chair. I think it kind of um, follows on from some of the other uh, questions that have been raised. But page one five six, the the, the drop um, when the council had ninety seven percent uh, inspections, which were rated good or better than good, and it dropped to um, under eighty percent uh, the following year. One of the reasons I noticed it's given is that um, the, the, the inspections went up from 11 to 17. I find that a little bit hard to, to, to accept. Uh, that, that means that the more they, they, they do, the, the, the worse we're going to get. I mean, it should be an even spread regardless of whether it's 11 or 17. So I really find that re reason somewhat spurious. Um, the question I think it actually raises, um, and it, it has been, it's been touched on by a number of the other questions is there, are we quite confident that we've got the proper support and budgets um, and that uh, there's no correlation with uh, with uh, reduced budgets with uh, lower standards. Um, is the service quite confident it does have support and budgets? I hope the answer is yes, uh, the, the answer is yes, but I think you know we absolutely recognise that we are delivering services in a very challenging um, current situation in terms of increased demand, increased workload. One of the areas that we're working to make sure that we absolutely deliver the services to the correct service users at the right level is we, we are currently developing a prioritisation framework which we will bring to committee for discussion and authorisation. Ian? Could you comment on, on the, the point I made about the, you know, the 11 up to 17 there? Because I, I really, I, I just find that very difficult to accept that we've had a drop simply because the number of inspections went up. Well, Ian? Um, I would say that that is a, a consequence of how we've calculated it. Again, I don't think the information we currently record gives us true reflection, which is why we are reviewing all of this reporting. And it is a historic way of how we've always reported, but I don't think it gives us true reflection. John? Thanks, Chair. Uh, I was just going to ask, Lillian, and following on for Councillor McKee's point, um, we're talking about... Uh, young people leaving care, and we're talking a lot about aftercare. Uh, do we actually still have a, a through care service? Because uh, I looked after many young people going into uh, independence, and uh, we would start a through care a year before they left, so that they had the skills, even if it was just learning to fill forms in, 
budget and, and all that sort of stuff because we always felt if they didn't have a good through care, the place, everything fell down and employment and that went with it. Do we have a, a through care team that, and a through care plan for young people leaving the service before they actually do? Lillian? Yeah, Councillor Sime, we do. We have a leaving care team, uh, which we, again, are currently looking at in terms of how it links in with um, other colleagues as we move into the new children, young people and lifelong learning department. But the short answer is yes, we do. Chair, sorry, can I just oh, add to that that there have been reporting difficulties around that particular indicator that we are working on and we should be able to provide an up-to-date figure when we come back in August at the end. Thanks for that, Angela. Ivor? Chair, it's with regard to Appendix 2, the performance for the Department's Health and Safety Action Plan. There's one box that's a sort of outlier there that says urgent action, management action required. <coughs> what sort of risk is that to the Department? Is it a, it's there, but it's manageable, or is it one that we have to worry about? Lillian? Yeah, um, we, we have re-established, um, absolutely accepted that we were at risk um, 31st of March 2015, but we've re-established, um, headed up by the head of, of um, adult services, the health and safety panel and performance within the service. So we're currently in the midst of being audited and I would be confident that we are not at risk, although we have not met that indicator. Thanks, Larry. Okay. So no other, Andy. Um, thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm just referring to the adult support and protection stuff on page 155. Um, I'm, I'm kind of referring here to jumping a wee bit about the agenda here, Chair, with your indulgence, because in item 10, we've got the minutes of the Adult Protection Committee and on page 168, item 4, item 3. Performance reports will include the number of days beyond the agreed threshold. Um, before an investigation was launched or a case conference held, the read 71 and 72 in the performance uh, report. How does that change marry up with that multi agency um, group's position? Graham, can you maybe address that? Sorry, Councillor Ferguson, can you affirm it? The page that you're looking at. Um, 168, um, it's, the, it's the minutes of the Adult Protection Committee and page 155, Graham. Item number four on yeah. 168. Yeah, um, yes, Graham. Yeah. Uh, you'll see it's a, it's a, like um, Roman three, like the I I I thing. Yeah. That's right. That's multi-agency reporting that goes to the Adult Support and Protection Committee. Um, this that is the third of the performance reports that have been considered. They're considering it in a new format. Um, this a uh, our current KPI is going to be replaced by um, one that you agreed last committee, which was about um, us reporting back to referrals within five days. Yeah, but we'll still have to do the other statutory stuff that's uh, laid out in the policy. Um, yeah. So we can't replace one, we should be adding another KPI. Sorry, what policy? Well, we currently have uh, reporting procedures in terms of time skills. Um, oh, yeah, no, that, 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 the, 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 yeah. the, the procedures aren't changing. The way that the, what we're reporting and where we're reporting it is changing. That's my point, Chair, is we, sh we shouldn't be taking a KPI away. We should be adding a KPI because make sure the, refer the referees have actually um, are, are happy that or, or be in contact within time is different from an, when um, some of the stuff is kind of laid out in guidance and other places. I think Graham's saying he's not taking a KPI away. Yeah. This, 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 this one, the one that we're currently reporting, what, um, 155, my understanding is that members agreed to replace that with the 
to get the, 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 the reporting back to refer us. You maybe want to have an offline discussion with, with Graham and Andy just to tidy it up, because if we agreed to remove it to the last committee, we'll hardly put it back to this committee. Um, I think that's my point, and um, I, I, I've not been smart here, but we need the independent chair of the Adult Protection Committee, so he's totally in the loop as well. The Adult Support and Protection Chair, I can assure you, is absolutely in the loop. Absolutely in the loop. Okay, with that, Gail. Thank you, Chair. I'll be brief. Um, page 15318 to Appendix 3. And it's there as provided um, for home care. Now, we're obviously aware of the pressures within this service, and it was just how often are the packages and, and needs reassessed? Um, and are we feeling, uh, I've mentioned the, the podiatry service previously, um, NH NHS made cuts to podiatry for elderly people and, and folk over 65, unless they had very serious podiatry issues. And the advice now is that their carers, whether it be an external agency that goes in to see them or, or our own carers, now have the responsibility of looking after these elderly people's feet. Um, but they're not trained, you know, and, and it is quite specialist. You know, it's not just a case of sending them to a beauty salon. Are we finding more and more pressure on that service because of impacts from other services? And how are we dealing with that in, in terms of staffing? Because if you have a 30-minute window to go in and see that elderly person and empty the commode and make sure she's okay, you probably don't have time to, to address more sort of clinical needs. Um, but at that point, we're then failing that user because they no longer have an outlet elsewhere to get that service. So it's just to understand how we're coping with cuts in other areas, particularly the NHS, which we are now being expected to pick up the burden on. Graham, can you deal with that question, please? I can't give you any precise figures about whether or not the withdrawal of podiatry services by the NHS is having an impact on our care at home services. What, well, what I can tell you is that the NHS podiatry service did offer training to a number of, of um, care agencies and care homes to do low-level podi podiatry. What I could tell you is that in some of the older people day centres, um, we are encouraging them to offer that sort of service or to have access to that sort of service. But in terms of, of numbers and on impact, I, I couldn't tell you. Well, I, I think on the back of that, we do have a lot of very good external agencies that do great work for us, but it might be interesting just to do an audit of how many of them have taken up that offer and ensuring that people that we're paying to do a, a service for us um, are getting the support that they need. Because I, I know there's huge challenges out there. Lillian's taking that on board for sure. Okay, members. In that case, we've got the recommendations. Two one review the overall summary of performance for social work services set in appendix one. We've done. Review the overall summary of performance for the Department Health and Safety Action Plan for period 2014-15 as set in appendix two. And scrutinise the exception reporting in appendix three and consider whether the actions proposed are adequate to improve performance and future monitoring of areas which have not yet met targets and recognise areas of good practice, high performance, where the target has been exceeded. Ian. Thanks, Eamon. It goes back to the comments that I made earlier. Uh, quite a few there, but I think we've got the reassurances from Lillian that we'll get a report back in September, and we could revisit this. So uh, whether we need to make that implicit within that recommendation, but I wouldn't want to go in and individually criticise each one and make recommendations, because we've got that report coming back. You'll get the performance update in September, aye, but we get a six monthly. So you'll get an update in, in September. Happy with that? Thank you. We'll go to item 8, Social Work Services Press Action Plan 2014-2015. Marlene will speak to this. Uh, thank you, members. Graham will answer any questions in terms of the report and the action plan. Um, I suppose I would, I would just wish to say that we recognise that we have a challenge in dealing with some of the issues that our staff are presented with on a daily basis. Uh, by the nature of our profession, social work is an extremely stressful profession for workers to um, deliver their services within, but we are working hard to support staff, and, and Graham will take any detailed question on the report and action plan. Thank you. And, uh, um, thanks, Chair. Uh, obviously, we we, we commend this whole thing and the whole initiative. Um, just a couple of questions, uh, if 
for Graham. Um, we've got, if I'm reading this right, in 2014-15, we had 23 people of we either definition of stress. Yep. Um, what was the total workforce at that time, and what was the percentage of social workers and support staff? Graham, we need to get you that that detail. Uh, yeah, that would help. I mean, I take the point that if, if the member of staff suffering from stress, they suffer from stress, but it would be actually really good to find out exactly where we are in terms of the, that would be good. Thank you. Okay, and I take it the usual arrangement will apply. Well, a member will get a copy of it, just you know, the information that's shared will go with everybody. Hey, Councillor McKee. It's, it's just on that, uh, I take it you're one area by area and not just to cover the whole of social work. Can uh, that be done? Um, no, I wouldn't have because that, would, that gives potentially actually identify a member of staff if we went by area by area. If there was only one person off, um, for example, in Newton Stewart, um, we would be identifying that member of staff, and that's no fair. No, I'm, I'm quite happy with the global figures. Okay, that's fine. That will save any a, a risk of exposing staff to undue scrutiny. Okay, any other member? In that case, can we? Councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chair, it's to the action plan on page 161, uh, and it refers to workloads, competing demands, uh, and then staffing levels uh, and understaff, uh, and uh, the status is that this is continuing and, and similar with the uh, un understaffed uh, situation that we've heard from Lillian today, that, that indeed that there are, uh, are three adverts out for one senior and two uh, sort of what grade uh, vacancies, but c could we give an, be given an indication of you know at one time uh, what load was running at something like a hundred and I remember uh, well uh, both from uh, Napier in Edinburgh and the University in London coming in and saying that the, the, the uh, optimum figure was about forty of, of a case load, but I think. We reduced it to 60. What are we running at just now in terms of what load? Uh, and how are we reducing that, accepting uh, the, the issue of absences and, and, and where do those caseloads go? Uh, who picks up the caseload and, uh, and deals with, with the issue temiously? Lillian, do you want to deal with that? Yeah, we are currently undertaking an assessment of workload. And um, again, I had said earlier that we are about to implement a new prioritisation framework, which I am. Um, confident will give us much more robust information in terms of the workloads that staff realistically are dealing with. In terms of when a worker goes on absence, then it is absolutely the responsibility of the locality manager to make sure that any work requiring to be addressed is, is um, undertaken within the team. But I accept that sometimes then what we would view to be lower priority work will go on hold um, so that we're meet, meeting the very high risk. One of the areas that we have um, undertaken in the last 10 months was to put locality social work managers within each locality so that they took that responsibility to ensure high-risk cases are managed when there are workers off absence. So I'll give you that assurance. Well, Chair, yeah, the, the status says that it's continuing. It must be continuing from somewhere. Uh, and I didn't get the answer there in terms of the workload, uh, in terms of capacity, as to, you know, at one time it was running 100 and it was reduced to something like 60, but the optimum was 40 for a, for a, a, a social worker. I'm asking what is the, the current average of, of a social worker dealing with per uh, case loads? I guess that's something you need to get as well sent on to you, because I wouldn't imagine that would be to hand, but I will ask. And, and of course, the assessment's ongoing. It should be ongoing and definitely ongoing anyway. We're currently reviewing the, the current workloads of staff. That's what I had said. And we're, we're looking at the whole tool to measure that workload. I, I really just ask, is there an average figure as to how many? Uh, you know, because you've got to benchmark it against something, surely. That's, oh, that's why we're introducing a prioritisation framework. Currently, we do not have a set workload uh, for, for social work staff. It's not in place. But it will be. Fine. Okay. Gail? 
Just a couple of brief points. Um, just referring back to uh, Councillor Ferguson's point about data, we have locality management now, so it seems fairly logical when we have a reporting area committee and such like as well, that we maybe get data you know, on a locality basis, not necessarily Newton Stewart as such, but Wigtonshire, um, Nithdale, Andale, Nithdale, and Stewartry. Uh, and I think it's really important for us to be able to scrutinise the locality right. movement um, and if there's any flaws in any particular area, then, then we can put the resources in there that's required rather than taking a whole regional blanket approach. The other area is, is it, would it be possible to have a breakdown of stress-related absence and such like between, say, frontline um, staff who are, are working out you know, with people every day as, as opposed to your administrative backroom managerial staff, or is that not possible, not even under an exempt paper? Because, again, I think it's important to find out who is under stress. Is it the managers, or is it the frontline staff, or is it both, or is it equal? or is one more than the other. And if we don't get that information, then we can't put things in place to improve that system. You realise that's a double-edged sword, of course, Gail. If you keep asking for more information, putting stress on staff, eh, Graham, I, I, I know it's a double-edged sword, is that, that, you know, but Graham. I, I think, is that not what Councillor Ferguson asked for, and we've agreed to, to, to get you? Um, what we'll do is we'll get you operational operational absences, management absences, and um, other, other, um, and um, we'll try and give you as much information as we can without, with, 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 with any HR parameters, yeah. Because right, I think that was a subtlety, Andy wanted a global thing, and Gail was wanting locality stuff. It will do as best we can without giving them the opportunity to, to identify any. Um, I actually wanted a report that wouldn't be able to identify individuals, and I would be quite happy to take it on a global scale, but I understand the need for integration in the four localities, but that's only part of the social work staff. So the other part, I'm not going to get localities, it's only adult care will be. Um, so we need to have a system that covers both of us as well. Okay. Right then, okay. On Stress action plan. Members are asked to consider and comment on the current stress action plan. We've done that and we're happy to see what's being done. Willie? Yeah, Chair, if I could ask uh, for a, a, an early report on again uh, what I referred to as the workload and the, the com com competing demand, uh, where we have a, 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 a report back on what is the, 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 the current workload uh, on average uh, for a social worker. Uh, with it categorised uh, into the different priorities as recognised by Lillian so that we have something we can benchmark in the absences, you know, as someone goes off, then, you know, does that increase to uh, unacceptable levels and, and, and indeed maybe some cases are left out there uh, that are not being uh, treated for. I think it's important that we do have that and it's not just because the report says it's continuing. My concern is that it's what's it being benchmarked against We'll I would bring like to see that coming back. We'll bring the prioritisation plan to members, and members can debate that because currently the information isn't available, so we might have to find some me means or mechanism to make some level of information available to members. But we'll bring the plan to you for next meeting. Needs to go through scrutiny, to go through scrutiny first, so. Be October. Okay. Thanks, members. In that case, we go to. Item 9 for noting, minute of the Dumfries and Galloway Adult Protection Committee, 19th of March 2015, happy to note that. Item 10, minute of the Dumfries and Galloway Child Protection Committee, 30th of March 2015, happy to note that. I have no other business that's urgent, so that concludes this meeting. However, we now introduce the Local Government Scotland Act, and Lucy has a slight amendment to the wording that's presented in the copy for members on the back of Stephen's question. Lucy, if you can just rehearse what the new wording is, please. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Thompson, but it's to consider adoption of resolution to exclude the public from the meeting in terms of section 51A4 of and paragraph 5 and paragraph 8 of part 1 of schedule 7A to the Local Government Scotland Act 1973. Is that Happy with that, Stephen? Yeah, I was hoping you would know better than me about that, but um, yeah, that sounds, sounds 
Than <laughs> I hope it's not me you're looking at it no better than you. Like, Lucy's fine. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so if members are happy to adopt that resolution, we'll ask all members of the public who are not part of the Social Work Service Committee to leave the room, please.